Good day everyone. So today we're gonna do something kind of unique. I'm gonna show you how to make fossils in your basement. And I don't just mean putting a clamshell and some play-doh and calling it a fossil. I mean turning this into something like this. Hang on, things are about to get weird. So how does this turn into this? Super simplified, this dies, gets buried in mud, the mud undergoes a lot of pressure, the fish gets squished super flat, and over time, the flesh turns to carbon. So that's all we gotta do. Now the first thing we need is something that's gonna be able to withstand a lot of pressure. Went to the metal store and I found this piece of cut off square tubing, and this will work nicely for a flask for our sediment. So let's take this and build a pressure box. So I drilled holes in some steel plate. We'll set those aside, I'll show you those later. Now we're gonna take this steel plate and weld it to the bottom to make an actual box. So my welding needs work, but I've got it sealed so it's 99% watertight, and that'll work. Now with the plates of steel that I drilled holes into, I threaded some rods through there. So now we have a cage. With our flask, this goes in there. And then for pressure, I've got this 20 ton jack. That goes in there, and we can compact our sediment. Now with these fossils, the matrix is limestone shale. It consists of microlaminations of very finely laid limestone. This piece alone has over 40 laminations by my count. So for our matrix, we're going to use the same kind of thing. Powdered limestone. Powdered calcium carbonate. Now one of the unique properties of the Green River Formation is that you're able to cleave off layers and see the fish in between the laminations. If I just sink a fish into a slurry of mud, I'm never gonna be able to cleave it off at the layer and see it like this. So we have to figure out a way to make a layer that will cleave apart. There's different ways to make rock cleave apart. And in something like this, it's a classed differential. Each layer has a different size grain. And because of that, it will part at that layer. So here I have a jar of limestone mud. It's all settled, and right at the top layer is the finest particles. Now by introducing another layer of fine sediment, this will produce another layer that we call a varve. Doing this over and over again is one way to replicate a series of microthin laminations. So we could layer our deposits like this. After each event, it settles, Another rain event happens, another storm, another something deposits another layer of material one at a time. That's going to be very time consuming. That's not how we're going to do our fossil. When the limestone is this finely powdered and you make a slurry of it, what ends up happening is this really thin layer of glassy carbonate limestone. I'm not really sure what it is, but it forms on the top and that little deposit is enough to make the layers separate and cleave apart when it's all dry. We could also form layers by moving sediment horizontally and it would differentiate, but that would take a big setup and it's usually done with much coarser grain material than this. So we have to do it like this. Now the reason I have to do it in slabs like that instead of having them submerged and slowly layering it 
is good luck getting a fish to stay at the bottom of that. I've tried it and every time I do, the fish eventually float to the top and they never get buried. Conditions that produce fish fossils like this are extremely unique. I know of no example in our world today that you can go to a lake and find fish laying on the bottom being slowly covered by mud. The Green River Formation shows massive fish die-off that were buried and preserved. However, there seems to be a disconnect when we compare it to what we observe today. While it's easy to find examples of fish dying, there is no known example that I'm aware of where we can see a massive numbers of fish sinking to the bottom of a lake and being preserved in the sediment the way we see in the Green River Formation. Whatever processes were involved were obviously very unique and very rare. Now they claim these would have been deposited in an anoxic lake, meaning deprived of oxygen, causing it to slow the rate of decay so they would last at the bottom. But again, show me an example of that. Show me where we actually see that happening today. Obviously, the conditions that these formed under were extraordinary and very unique. Definitely not an everyday occurrence. And that makes these fossils very special. So this layer has firmed up a bit. It's glossed over. We're ready for the second layer. And there's the next layer. I put a pinch of powdered clay in the corner so I'll be able to distinguish where the layer is when it comes time to split it. Now the last thing I'm going to do is just add a layer of sand on top. That's going to help hold everything down when I put the pressure on. I have to add pressure really slow. If I were to just crank down and put a ton of pressure on there, all that sediment is still really mucky and goopy and it would just squish out the edges. So as that sediment dewaters every few days, I'll come put a few more pumps up in there and then as the weeks go by and those fish start to melt down a little bit, I'll keep pressurizing it until eventually it's at as much pressure as the container will handle. Hopefully 20 tons. Everybody asks a question, oh, doesn't that stink? No, it's completely encased. It's like a sarcophagus. There's no airflow. It really doesn't stink. Next question, how long does this take? It takes years. Minimum six months. I've done mice and small things pretty cool in about six months. But something like this, I'll let it sit at least a year, maybe longer. And of course, what everybody wants to know, what does this actually look like when it's all done? Back in 2004, I filled a 55 gallon drum with layers of limestone using the same process. I had it pressurized and moist underground for 14 years after letting it dry for several years. I finally opened it to see what was inside. Now the matrix I chose to use in this setup was calcium hydroxide. Unfortunately, it shrunk an awful lot when it dried and it ended up in a lot of fractures the results of these synthetic fossils look pretty cool to me. Whether it be chipmunks, or fish, or bugs, or lizards, or birds, it all turned out pretty cool. I think with some more trial and error, I'll be able to improve my techniques and produce an even higher quality synthetic fossil. Or maybe this will inspire you to do the same thing, and you can improve upon it. Who knows? Maybe you're as weird as I am. So as I sit here, I need to keep it wet 
for as long as it's decaying, as long as it's fossilizing. When it's time to crack it open, then I let it dry. The things I wish I knew, I wish I knew exactly how much pressure it takes to lithify the rock. I also have absolutely no idea how much pressure these fish were actually put under when they were fossilized. How deep were they under the surface? What was the geothermal gradient at that level? So what was the temperature? I can't replicate that. But right now, this is the best I can do. If you want to see what this turns into, come back in one year and I'll crack it open. I do sculpting and bronze casting, but this is a whole different type of art project. Hope you enjoyed watching that. We'll get back to the regular stuff next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Also, the cave dripper's still dripping for anybody that follows that. Slowly growing.